सो वी आर लाइव हेलो एवरी वन गुड इवनिंग एंड वेलकम टू द फर्स्ट एपिसोड ऑफ द सेकेंड सीजन ऑफ टूरिया टॉक्स आफ्टर अ वेरी सक्सेसफुल फर्स्ट सीजन ऑफ टूरिया टॉक्स वॉज रिसेंटली कंक्लूडेड वी प्रोमिस यू वी विल बी बैक एंड वी आर हियर टूडे वी आर लाइव ऑन यूट्यूब As you all know, Turiya Talk Season Two is a wisdom sharing series featuring entrepreneurs, academics, corporate leaders, and today is no different. Today we have someone amongst us who has nearly three decades experience spanning over industries. Mr. Raghu Kavle, welcome to Turiya Talks and honoring us with our uh, presence. All right. For the first time ever on Turiya Talks, we have two dignitaries with us. Joining Mr. Kavle, we have uh, someone whose career too spans over almost thirty uh, years. She is the editor of PR Moment India, uh, Ms. Parul Chand. Uh, welcome, sir. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for having us, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, welcome to Turiya Talks. Before we get any further. let me ask both of you a question sir and ma'am you have been around the corporate scene for decades now could you imagine uh, at a very uh, start of your career that you would be in bombay uh, gurgaon bangalore communicating with someone here in calcutta via web and having a lively discussion live and being watched by hundreds uh, so of course we'll discuss but before that uh, when uh, we officially start the session i would request uh, raghu sir uh, to introduce himself and what he has done over the years and uh, then uh, would request uh, ma'am to take it forward yeah sandhya always happy to be on a show with you uh, known you for a while now always admired your energy and enthusiasm to try out new things and uh, it's it's definitely an honor to be here and it's an honor to be with somebody like parul an accomplished individual like parul so just to introduce myself uh, i presently head the india business side in forces and have been there for a while uh, i i was i have been around for about 30 36 years uh, in the profession the uniqueness is that i have been through various uh, various aspects of technology graduated as a civil engineer Worked as a power plant engineer, electrical engineering happened. Went into mechanical engineering, then went into chemical engineering. Did a lot of sustainability in sea water desalination. Then from there switched over to computing. Went to the U.S. Then came back to India. So that gives me a bird's eye view of not only computing as a technology, overall technology as a whole. the other aspect which i've been lucky perhaps is the fact that a uh, fate has taken me i would say my birth and fate has taken me through various states of india right from bengal to karnataka to uh, maharashtra to tamil nadu to andhra so in a sense i can really appreciate what india is and uh, i really can see the impact of technology on society and i think it's fascinating that people in the short term sort of overestimate the impact of technology but in the long term they underestimate the impact of technology so i'll speak a little more little bit more about that but as i said it's an honor and a pleasure to be here thank you sir ma'am please uh, in yeah readers uh, our viewers will be very very happy uh, to know you thank you it's so kind of you sandhya firstly kudos to you for putting this together and for correlating all of us and uh, as raghu rightly said we really enjoy, uh, enjoy and admire your energy to uh, to persevere and do these kind of platforms so thank you for that uh, very pleased to be here with uh, with raghu I, I i see myself as a listener on this show and uh, you know really look at meta trends because in our daily lives we hardly have time to step back and look at the meta trends that are shaping us which we hardly know about so i'm really looking forward to that uh, apart from pr moment india of course uh, um, 
I started my career with television journalism about almost 28 years ago uh, with a show called India Business Report on BBC. And I'm very pleased to be here. And, and uh, a short anecdote, when we were working with BBC, we used to actually send the video of the recorded show via British Airways until it reached we were under tension. And today, like you rightly said, Sandhya, I, I could do this with a click of a button, send the video. So things are really good. Over to you. Right, sir. right. Uh, so can we start uh, the session? We, when people came to know that, sir, you're coming, we were flooded with so many questions. But as the format is just of 45 minutes, so we'll ask all the relevant questions. Uh, so the first question which we got uh, from people is, how are Indian companies trying to incorporate AI in, its, in their operations uh, going forward, of course, post-COVID uh, times? Yeah. Um... I would not restrict myself to Indian companies, but uh, I do. I will answer the question. But I re refer you to Ramcharan's Professor Ramcharan's book, Attackers' Advantage. He says that most companies which are successful today have a mathematical algorithm or an artificial in algorithm, artificial intelligence algorithm in their middle. Now, when people think of artificial intelligence, they think of robots and they think of moonwalkers and so on and so forth. Well, that's one portion of artificial intelligence. But if you split down artificial intelligence, at the basic heart of it is the ability of a machine to learn itself. Because the computer, when it started off in 1940s or 1950s, was essentially a dumb computer. But today, can it learn on its own? Can it give out with mathematical algorithms? Can it give out data which is predictability on its own? So if you look at the stock market darlings in the US, Facebook, what they call the FANG, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, uh, most of them have an algorithm as their central thesis. Thank so you. I would say that uh, most organizations today will have an algorithm of some and uh, even if they don't have it for their entire organization, they would have it for parts of their organization. Banks, for example, will have algorithms which tell you uh, how you would, you know, they would sort of look at the customer satisfaction, which would be an algorithm by itself. They will look at stock trading, which will be another algorithm by itself. They will look at uh, their debt equity, they look at their ratios, cash ratios, etc., which would be an so there will be a lot of algorithms that is happening. And uh, I think a lot of Indian organizations are going down that path. And I don't think so. There is, it's an inevitable path. Right, sir. Right. Sir, another question. Will the development of AI be aggravated by the impact of COVID-19? Very good question. Uh, let me, you know, refer you, you know, the, one of the things that I like about the lockdown, of course, I don't like COVID and the COVID virus is not a particular friend of mine, nor do I wish to make his acquaintance, uh, okay. his or her acquaintance, whatever it may be. Uh, the, but it has given me a lot of time to read a lot of books. Okay? And Alan Greenspan's in his, in his autobiography, if those of you, it's, it's a very good read talks about the time of 9-11 or when the World Trade Center collapsed. And uh, right. if those who remember history will remember that the uh, you know World Trade Center collapsed milestone was preceded by the entire uh, dot-com boom and bust. You know, the dot-com boom and bust happened around just before the World Trade Center collapsed. So what had happened was that there was always there was almost a lot of investment or buy which happened in technology of various nature. So after the World Trade Center collapse, when the world came up, the economy came up, the labor participation, you know, economists have uh, various algorithms. They say, okay, if the GDP goes up by so much, there's no employment. That did not happen. The reason was the people had started getting used to all the technology that had already pumped in. So coming back to the present situation, 
we are on StreamYard now, but then there is Zoom, there is uh, Teams and uh, Skype and uh, and so many other software. They were always there. The problem was that we had it in our mindset that unless we have this sort of a panel discussion, a sort of brick and mortar setting, it's not going to happen. But today, we are saying, okay, now you, when you can't do that, can we use technology? So technology has always been there. So I would say that it has accelerated the use of technology, not the invention of it. We haven't as yet seen new invention from COVID, but we have seen use of technology. Right, sir. I wanted to ask you something. Uh, the advent of and development of any technology is associated with the progress of society collectively, and definitely it uh, makes our life easier. However, there is a prevalent fear about AI present among people uh, concerning the number of jobs that uh, could be lost. Uh, so what do you have to say about this, sir? There's a very, um, I'm going to take a little bit of time and try and explain this, okay? The advent of technology is going to change the way uh, any job is done. And that has been there through the ages. First had a locomotive, you first possibly had fire. We don't know what happened before the fire came because it was too far back. But then you had, when you had locomotives, you know, obviously all the horse carriages went out of business. Then when you had the mobile phones, a lot of, you know, STD booths went out of business. I still remember in my college days when I had to call home, I had to stand, go and stand outside the STD booth and, uh, you know, there'd be four or five people and uh, we had to wait for them to finish before we call home. And all of us used to be calling after nine o'clock because we that half rate sort of a thing. Okay. Right. And eight o'clock it was half rate and 10 o'clock it was quarter rate or whatever. Okay. So and all that, there has been a lifestyle change. Obviously, algorithms will cause change. Algorithms will cause pain. Now, today what is happening is in no field is there a pure play a human intervention or a pure play algorithm. But algorithms have already invaded us. Now, let me give you an example of stock trading. Now, in the example of stock trading, yes, stock traders may press the final button. There are very few hedge funds which go in for algorithmic trading. But then there are algorithms which at the back give you what are the stocks, what are the you know, shoulder patterns, what are the day trading you need to do, so on and so forth. So it's a partnership between the robo, if you may call it that, the and the man. Okay. Similarly, if you look at military or uh, agricultural applications, drones are very commonly being used. Now, you send out a drone, you get a lot of pictures. Now, you need right. somebody who actually look at those pictures and sort of say, okay, this particular area of agriculture requires maybe, you know, you're going to get the locust or you're going to get something. So, you need, again, a partnership between the robo, which is the drone, which is sending back pictures, and the human being. Okay. So, you will not, the jobs will not totally go away. But what will happen is it will, it will change from skill base to knowledge base. Okay, you need to understand what sort of an output is being given by the algorithm. How is this algorithm giving you this? What is it given? And how do you do decision making? So, to that extent, there will be a shift. There will be a sort of uh, more number of jobs which come, which use. Whatever is the technology used by algorithms to be able to use. For example, if you take doctors, you may have an algorithm for a person. You know, a person may be monitored for blood pressure, uh, sugar levels, thyroid levels, etc. And there can be an algorithm to show what he is. But it requires a doctor who can understand that and then give him some sort of a solution. So it's a partnership. But yes, there will be a lot, a lot of change in jobs. Skill sets will go away. Right, sir. 
uh, when we talk about uh, technology and the impact of it in society i think we have to also talk about biotechnology uh, so sir if you can throw some light on what are the uh, some latest developments in biotechnology in relation to prevention uh, from the coronavirus uh, that has intrigued you as a as an expert yeah i see biotechnology it's a large field okay so uh, if you look at um, you know uh, let me talk about the this earth in general the planet earth the planet earth came into being some maybe about 4000 5000 million years back for almost about 2000 3000 million years there was no life on earth okay then there were two two instances with sort of made life possible on earth one is around uh, about uh, 1000 million years back water started coming on the earth then about 600 about 600 or 700 million years back give or take a few million years it doesn't matter when you're talking in that time scale you got oxygen so then they came what they call a cambrian explosion that is called the famous cambrian era you can google and see cambrian explosion where the number of species that sort of grew in the water grew and then these species came on the land and one of these species became our forefathers uh, the monkeys and the gorillas and from where we have all okay so like that there are two sort of technology trends that have actually defined us both of which happened around the 1940s one is the advent of digital technologies for those who are those who are interested what isaacson has a book called the innovators now and uh, for those who are interested the second one is the gene by siddharth mukherjee okay mankind has always been intrigued by this fact as to how does you know how do sort of uh, how do you know you get your father's features or your mother's features how do you do this today we know about the xx and the yy and the chromosomes and all those things but that did not happen till 1950 till a guy called walter crick watson and crick who got the nobel prize in 1962 discovered the entire mechanism of the dna and the gene okay now so today if you look at biotechnology biotechnology has i would say two portions to it one is wonder drugs okay for example if you take statin as a wonder drug it has stopped so many heart attacks that they are saved so many families from dying of heart attack or dying of heart attacks metformin for diabetes so the pharma industry has done a lot of work the other portion of biotechnology is many of these are becoming genetic so what is happening today is most people are living till past 80 okay and uh, we haven't seen anything as yet because though walter crick and watson figured <coughs> out that you know they had uh, they had uh, they had the gene all covered they did not get into sequencing which happened only recently and today we need to see how do we sort of change the gene if you will okay right. now if that happens uh, people living to four score 20 which is 100 years that uh, is not going to be a rarity anymore okay which means that you can work till your 75 which means a whole lot of social economic change in society which in pensions do not start till 35 which means you can study till your 35 or 40 you can start earning when you are 40 which means a whole lot of things seriously so uh, i would say that and artificial intelligence combined together are like the oxygen and water it sort of created the cambrian explosion and society is just waiting to go into a new trend fine sir uh, sir what are the some of the key concerns of biotechnology regarding human health and biodiversity according to you see there are a lot of ethical issues involved 
see today i think we are on the verge you know if if i want to create a replica of myself i possibly could create it but is it ethical i don't know if if somebody wants a designer baby maybe he could create it but how ethical is it you know isn't it going back to the nazi philosophy of creating the perfect baby so those are certain ethical questions see uh, the entire aspect of uh, inheritance and genetic inheritance got a bad name during the nazi era because uh, because of the entire eugenics and uh, we saw the massacres and so on now are we trying to create what is perfect in anybody's mind we don't know so right. are we trying to nature so those are questions that are ethical questions that remain unanswered and uh, i think there's a lot of debate going on there and i think uh, um, you know i'm a technologist so uh, i'm not a, i'm not a, a, a what you would call a sociologist or whatever it is but i'm sure it will have a lot of implications on society on the way laws are written etc right sir for example for example if i meant to create create a clone of myself would i keep the same ragu part carry on for 200 years right sir so it, it one, sounds like yeah, right sir right one last question from my side and then of course parul ma'am will take it forward and then uh, we'll uh, request our viewers uh, to ask sir uh, i just wanted to ask you sir when we talk about uh, few people from science and technology domain uh, like stephen hawking elon musk bill gates and many other big names they have recently expressed concern in the media and via open letter also they have talked about the risk posed by ai uh, joined by many uh, leading ai research uh, researchers i need to say so what are the biggest threats uh, posed by uh, ai according to you specifically the i would say the biggest threat is the mind shift change see you are not going to be able to stop technology from coming yeah you can delay it from coming like the covid lockdown you can't stop infection by having a lockdown you can flatten the curve and prevent the infection right similarly by having laws and regulation you can possibly delay it coming but it's not going to stop right sir so the biggest threat as i see is your feeling of irrelevance so let me explain to you the feeling of irrelevance in the last century which is the, the 1900s at the beginning of last century we had possibly uh, four forms of governments i would say in 1900 if you even back 100 years you had monarchy you had fascism you had communism you had democracy now i think the 1910 world war 1910 or 1920 world war one put an end to monarchy and said monarchy is not the way to go you had all sorts of revolutions you know monarch what was monarchy uh people people were saying okay the king is supreme the king will take the, the rest of us and instead of the king you had a fascist movement where somebody as the dictator will come and say i am the know all i will take it that also got de defeated in world war 2 then you had two movements the communist movement and the uh, democratic liberal movement the communist movement with the fall of the berlin wall it was proved to be ineffective and uh, so today we have the democratic the democratic liberal movement goes on your feelings when you go out to vote or when you go out to do something so somebody is taking your opinion somebody is sort of doing something which is good but it has its limitations now a question that 
next answer is if there is an algorithm which does everything for you how relevant are you so i think the biggest fear is that of the algorithms right uh parul ma'am please take it forward uh, yes uh, thank you sandhya for setting the tone for the discussion and thank you ragu for sharing the fantastic overview of why we're discussing this uh, topic um uh, what really struck me from our discussion yesterday and of course today is that we are an algorithm driven society and like you said the fang uh, you know the fang uh, acronym that you use for the most successful companies uh, given that the audience is mostly communicators why do we need to know that uh, why is algorithm becoming so all pervasive and important and how do we apply it good question parul see uh i know most uh, i know some pr people fairly well and uh, in a sense that i know them through their subconscious and most of them are who are very knowledgeable in their field and possibly uh, are they intuitive in the way they communicate with whom are they have to communicate is good but what is happening today with technology is one is able to figure out what are the various uh, aspects which will impact the human mind for example you basically think that it's free will but then what people have done when they have scientifically proven that if you sort of position certain things some way with a particular jingle with a particular tone then you know you possibly uh, are going to win you are possibly going to win a lot better okay now there are n number of studies which are done which have already i would say data dataized i know there is no such word or i would say let me make it into a little more less fancier word i would say convert it into a data the various aspects of which an intelligent pr professional would do and this has been a good algorithm now obviously there are certain nuances which you may not be able to still uh, put into an algorithm now obviously a pr professional needs to take the help and figure out how many of those tools are really important how many of those tools you want because you know your job but i am not a pr professional myself right. the other aspect is like the famous saying you are living in the best of times and the worst of times the best of times is what sandhya is doing where she is bringing us all together on you know we need not fly here we need not fly there we need not go room so on and so forth so is the best of times. a lot of technology available we use a lot of technology However, what is the worst of times? How much of a PR can you do in a disaster situation? How much of a PR can you do to sort of say a particular person is not who he is? Because a lot of data is out there. There's a lot of transparency out there. everything is on whatsapp everything is on facebook everything is on twitter so how would you white wash something which is not white washable or i'm sorry to use the word white wash how would you portray something else so as a pr professional you really need to be careful because people will hold you accountable and at that i would say the worst of times because you obviously you cannot say i will paint something black into white or black but it's the best of times because you have great deal of knowledge uh <clears throat> thank you ragu that's actually very interesting and you've given a very important uh, cue to communicators that <clears throat> you have to be more authentic and you have to convey this to the brand because sometimes the communicator communicator does get a lot of pressure from the brand to convey certain things 
which may or may not be authentic to to what a journalist wants or even what is good for the brand so i think it's a very important message that you've given us for the communicators that be authentic uh, be very focused on what is real and i I'd just like to add one point here that uh, the earlier pr professionals they were very much behind the scenes but technology has also forced them to be in front of the camera like sandhya is today so the messenger as the messenger you are going to be under scrutiny as much as your brand so that is also a big change that technology is bringing and covid is bringing very fast so uh, flowing from that ragu my question really is you know the whole uh, aspect of being authentic um, and you mentioned how the old concept of killing is actually not relevant anymore uh, could you explain a little bit about that how does what does that mean for me at the box when you say authentic let us start with personal choices whatever are your personal choices i think you know the digital has taken away the closet there is no more closet this closet that okay you need to be clean about your choices either not talk about them or if you talk about your choices be honest about them number 2 everybody can see you have made a mistake i think many public figures have won empathy sympathy and votes by saying yes we made a mistake number 3 uh, you know you don't try to if you are if you are weak in a particular dimension and you know it and you are a leader it's better you acknowledge that you are weak in that particular dimension and strengthen yourself by being by being together a part of a team which then helps you to take the agenda forward for the people or for your company or for an institution which you work i think that's a much better bet rather than trying to you know be what you are not so i think that is not something which will work uh, what you think is a sea change in how we work not only for the employee but for the employer as well and one of the things which have come up uh, during covid is that uh, a lot of self supervision is required because you are working from home and it a lot of it is is on your honor system to to deliver the work and not do moonlighting or data theft uh, today's uh, economic times carry the fascinating story that some companies are asking it uh, the it team that you are actually uh, coordinating the board meeting so please disclose the investments of your nearest relatives so that you know to ensure that there is no insider trading taking place so we are, these are all these are very new things so what does it mean really for the employer to show empathy to show concern and to 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 respond to all these uh, um changes the technology is bringing about and yet protect the firm see yeah, i the brand i think yeah i think once you explain to the individual why you are asking him to do what he needs to do i don't think so any individual who is an honest individual will refuse to do it with its logic okay for example yeah even i am an officer of my company and if i am invited to a board meeting uh, you know i obviously have to disclose what what me and my close relatives there is or do not own okay what are my interests because you are you are subjected to a lot of information uh second is you know you need to be very uh, you need to be able to communicate very frequently with all your uh, colleagues either through webex or through skype and make them still feel wanted for example we had this individual of ours who is uh, you know retired and we made sure that a cake was delivered to his home and uh, we had a gift given to him at his home and uh, we had a webex meeting where all of us gathered on a webex to wish him well because he was an old timer who had spent 30, 27 years with us and uh, 
really needed to make sure that just because of COVID, you don't rob him of his going away party. Right? Similarly, you know, there are some individuals uh, who will be celebrating anniversaries and we need to ensure that they feel wanted. Okay. And uh, so I think we need to communicate more than before, especially loneliness bring unnecessary fears. At least when you're in the office, we can walk over to somebody's desk and say, hey, you know, you don't look too good. What's, what's up? Can we have a cup of coffee and can we discuss? But when he's at home, you just don't know. So you need to take time out to sort of communicate to them and say, everything okay, how are things with you, so on and so forth. So I think we need to explain communication is the name of the game. Communicate, communicate, communicate. Communicate through all means, email, social media. Social media. Be in touch. Uh, that's actually a very important message for our audience because uh, communication is going to become much more strategic and much more important than, than it ever was before because I think communicators always feel that they're not considered a strategic uh, function in a brand. So as, uh, what you're saying is, is very heartening for them. Uh, having said that, uh, a lot of PR professionals and all of us, in fact, are facing this whole thing of are, are we still ready for the new changes which are happening uh, in the environment. And you made a very important point that it's not just about skills, it's about shifting to knowledge and be ready to face the fact that change is coming. Acceptance is important here. So uh, based on what you said, so what is this knowledge-based approach to, uh, to skilling, for lack of a better word? Uh, uh, what is this knowledge-based approach that you would recommend? See, there will be two societies. Uh, one is people who have skills. When I say skills, there will be people, you know, who can uh, drive a car, uh, do the garden. Yeah, they are important. They are our colleagues in society who, uh, they are our eminent colleagues in society who keep the fires burning, so to speak. But they, their jobs can be automated or replaced or done away with. The guys who run the drones or the stock traders, etc., will get a definitive competition. Now, there was this entire uh, there's this entire thing I was reading in the Hindu the other day about loss of certain livelihoods. Yes, in every generation that happens, excepting it's happening faster than. Uh, so, what happens? How do you prepare for that? You need to get back to the basics. For example, you know, even if you look at, if you just go look back at statistics, we always say Bill Gates, Steve Jobs did not attend college, but they attended high school. So, if the K to 12 education is where a lot of discipline gets put in. So, there is no taking away from the fact that you need a very robust K to 12 education, whether it be on the sciences, whether it be on accounting, or it be on you know social sciences. Because if somebody doesn't understand, uh, you know, uh, if somebody doesn't understand, uh, let's say, calculus, how is he going to understand the algorithm? Uh, So that, that's where I would say is the change between what we have as skill-based and knowledge-based. So we need to have a really solid, rock-solid education. Uh, thank you, Raghu. And I'm going to hand over to Sandhya because I think she's getting audience questions. So over yeah, to Sandhya. Uh, yeah. So we have a question from Shruti Sharma. Uh, uh, she is asking, sir, how far are we from the optimum utilization of uh, AI and robotics in, in, in India, particularly? Okay. Robotics is a big word. So let me sort of... Uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of history. So the word artificial intelligence was coined in Dartmouth, where 12 people met in the uh, fall of 1950 and they coined the term artificial intelligence. Among them were people like Harvard 
Minsky, who built the Society of the Mind, which is freely available. Okay. Karen Minsky uh, and uh, other people, sort of, uh, Simon Newell, Marin Minsky, all these people sort of got into artificial intelligence. However, if you look at artificial intelligence as it stands today, you break it down into three, four sub branches. One of them is machine learning, one of them is natural language processing, third is computer vision. All of them put together is robotics. So, is AI already in India? AI is already in India because when you use your Google Maps, you're using a lot of data using machine learning, which is nothing but a subset of uh, robotics. Now, when you use YouTube and YouTube gives out your favorite, it is nothing but machine learning. So, obviously, there is a set of machine learning. Now, coming to robotics, we already have, for example, uh, I have already sold software for self-driving huggies to a company here in Bangalore. And that particular software is going to be used in all the buggies which will transport you around any campus. Okay, we don't make the money. Sort of partnership. So to, to that extent, you already have a robot driver. Okay. So robotics is already here in India. I would say we are not at the top end of society like the Americas and the Japans and etc. of the world, but we are not at the bottom end and uh, we are somewhere in the middle. From, uh, so, Vaipan Pukai says, Sir, from an upskilling perspective, we are learning only for people with skills. Can anyone else master the technology? You don't need coding, Vaipan, uh, because uh, Today, today there are machines which go, but yes, you need to understand your math, and you need to understand high school math. Okay, so coding is a skill. Coding is going to become another skill, like carpentry or whatever it is, because there are machines which are going to code. Okay, so to that extent, I would say AI is going to be for everybody, and everybody can learn. Uh, I I learned uh, AI myself from uh, my uh, uh, previous boss, uh, who went to the he recommended a couple of books to me, and that got got me started on AI. And lo and behold, uh, you no, know, I found it fascinating. So when I can do it, I'm sure it's so can you. I have another question. Uh, we have flooded with Rishabh questions, and to, yeah, Rishabh. Uh, uh, after Bachi, COVID 19, uh, the importance of having a very strong immune system is clear to all of us. Uh, can biotech be used to improve the quality of food? Yeah, G GM foods is what we have. Of course, it has taken a little, little bit of a wrap because we do not know what sort of, a, uh, you know, sort of uh, impact it has on the human body. But yes. Uh, the uh, quality of food needs and has to be improved uh, with the recent, uh, you know, announcement in the agricultural laws, etc., etc. One goes, investment goes into that, and uh, if we can figure out a safe way of getting uh, foods which can increase our immunity, that should be great. Uh, right. Uh, some other questions, uh, sir, would be happy. Uh, what is the scope of careers in biotechnology as a career uh, from Shinjini Mahato? It is, yeah. Uh, it is possibly, in fact, uh, um, uh, after, uh, after I finish this and before I finish this, I was teaching a course called Digital Medicine. And I talked about the impact of genetics and uh, how do you use gene therapy your diseases. So today, we know what the gene sequencing has been done. The Human Genome Project has been done. Now we know uh, we know which genes affect which sort of a disease. Uh, people are today playing with are doing the gene treatment only if it's sort of life-threatening. For example. If a baby has a spinal dystrophy, which is a condition where the spine doesn't expand, yes, obviously, the 
very painful condition and a life threatening situation and uh, there is a gene i think ec2 or one of those genes which has to be modified and that is modified using injecting a virus which is on the gene or with using nano fat balls which changes the gene how are can you use genetic for you know let's say i have diabetes can i can the doctor tell me you know what i'll do a gene therapy for you why don't you check in next weekend and you can check out on wednesday so i would think biotechnology is a career which is going to be there there are going to be two streams in biotechnology one is going to be public health public health has always been a career which has uh, which has always been around because right from the time when the dolan hill study said that the uh, framingham study said that smoking is injurious they are so on and so forth now when epidemiologists are studying the entire covid if you put tv today there is a lot of uh, chatter about how is this entire thing going to sort of that is biotechnology so there is public health and then private health another question from avantika ghosh what is the impact of ai in marketing so i think this will help me and parul ma'am also uh so the impact of ai in marketing is here and now so if you have been seeing i'm a google watcher so google the ad revenues have been falling so which is considerable they are in billions of and uh, google is supposed to be the big bad boy of the ad world am i right parul so yes, in the sense right. that they are, they are supposed to have the monopoly and all that but today if you look at it artificial intelligence is such a big thing in marketing especially in targeted marketing that without artificial intelligence i doubt whether you can do a focused campaign in fact i'm involved in a startup which sort of looks at how do you sort of spend the data how is the impact of the data there are places where you are able to get data from you know customers eye movements on a screen you are able to get data from customers movements in stores you are able to get data from a whole lot of things which sort of uh, you know collate with each other which start, which help sales people right from product placement to auditation let me give you a simple example and this was an example of 20 years back walmart has some of the best tools those of you who remember the fateful event of 9/11 uh, i think the first plane hit the towers at about 30 am eastern which is approximately 5:30 on the west coast and the second plane i think hit about an hour later or half an hour later so by about 8 o'clock in uh, arkansas somebody in walmart figured out that they had an algorithm which was crudely written not as sophisticated as today that people the americans express grief in a different fashion they put flags on their cars and on their backyards the front yards and all that so they found that you know hey people are buying flags like nobody's business so what did they do they called up their chain suppliers and said can you send us all the american flags you have and they made a killing on them okay the second one was in another uh, retail store So they, uh, this store sold both diapers and uh, beer. And uh, in the U.S., you have the situation where the father has to help out when the child is born. You know, couples are on their own. It's not like in India where there are elders to help. And they found when the father goes to buy a diaper, he buys a pack of a pack of beer. Maybe you know it's the feeling that he has to when he changes the diaper, he has to have beer. so what they did was as a product placement they put the diapers and the beer next to each other so you know there are a lot of interesting scenarios like that can you comment on inherent actually seal of being programmed by humans when they carry biases and ethical shortfalls of the creator yes probably yes they do have uh, they do have the biases uh, over over a period of time those biases 
possibly even those biases can be programmed to be removed but today yes the biases are going to be carried out and there will be biases which which will be carried on and those biases are what it what makes it dangerous yes there is that dangerous one that such a thing as of today it is there but when you talk about genetic programming and things like that maybe yes maybe you can right right so can we wrap up the show or uh, sir if you are here people will keep on asking for next 5 hours also uh, and yes, uh, yes and we couldn't welcome another guest uh, along with parul ma'am sir so when you were speaking it was so silent it didn't bark so yeah, i'm yeah. very happy <laughs> yes <laughs> fine uh, so we are at the end of yet another wonderful episode of uh, turiya talks in our first uh, season we have uh, uh, grown in leaps and bounds our viewing went up by almost uh, 500% in uh, nine episodes and it wouldn't have been following uh, without uh, our audience it is your support that urged us to uh, start with season 2 and uh, we started season 2 with a bang uh, with raghu sir and uh, parul ma'am uh, so i would like to really thank you uh saran ma'am and uh, to my audience i would say that uh, please keep writing to us about guests uh, you would want to see and the issues you would like uh, to be addressed as a marketing and communications agency our aim is always to provide our audience with better insights so they can make an informed decision we hope to build and grow on these values and sir has actually talked about dads so i think i would like to say something interesting so dads are most ordinary people turned by love into heroes adventurers storytellers and singers of song though my father couldn't sing well fine uh, so when we talk about uh, uh, fathers day uh, it's celebrated across the world with the objective of realizing and honoring the uh, contribution of fathers in the society uh, so next saturday when we meet we will talk about uh, role of father in parenting uh, with the uh, l rama swami he is the um, he is the uh, teacher and chief events uh, coordinator from uh, vedanta calcutta uh, this is dedicated uh, to fathers we have kept two special sessions uh, for fathers uh, so i think this uh, we could do and uh, today's session was quite interesting so those who have joined us late today can watch the entire episode in the video now uh, let us know your thoughts in the comments too so see you next saturday that is uh, 13th of june uh, on yet another episode of turiya talks stay tuned uh, sandhya sotodia signing off uh, take care and have a great week ahead thank you so much sir. Thank you.